Today's video is sponsored by Skillshare. Skillshare is an absolute must for those who wish to learn and then create. By now, you have probably heard about them due to their popularity, and for good reason. Yet if you haven't, let me tell you a bit about their wide range of services that will surely pique everyone's interest. We as humans love learning new things and putting them to work, whether that be for an actual job or just for a hobby. With Skillshare, you will have access to thousands of different courses ranging from photography, web development, animation, and creative writing. I myself have used Skillshare before when I started my channel by learning about Premiere Pro Basics that was taught in about 20 minutes by awarded filmmaker Benjamin Ortega. After learning what he offered in his video, I was much more confident when editing videos. With Skillshare, you get the luxury of learning from the privacy of your own home and at your own pace. Another good thing is that you will find no distracting ads in any of the videos. So, whether you are just starting out and wanting to learn something new, or already have years of experience and just want to sharpen your skills even further, then Skillshare is an amazing tool to add to your expanding arsenal. And as an added bonus, the first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a free premium membership trial so you can explore your creativity. So head on over to Skillshare after this video and find what fascinates you. On November 15, 1977, a 13-year-old girl was walking home from the gym with two of her friends. As the group neared their respective homes, goodbyes were made, and the last remaining girl made the final steps to her front door. However, 13-year-old Megumi Yakoda would never reach her destination, and instead seemed to vanish along with the fading sun. Fast forward 40 years later, and Megumi not only still remains missing, but her story has been responsible for starting a chain of events that would leave the country of Japan mourning for more than four decades. A series of secrets so hidden you would only think this to be possible in a spy novel or TV show. A crime that would make its way all the way to the Prime Minister of Japan. A trail of lies, broken families, feuding countries, and what started as one missing girl that turned into multiple people vanishing. This is the story of the vanishing of Megumi Yakoda. Born in Nagoya, Japan, Megumi Yakoda was the oldest of three siblings and was seen as a bright, active, and overall happy teenager with a fondness for both writing and several different sports. Her family consisted of her father Shigeru, her mother Saki, and her two younger twin brother and sister, Takua and Testua. The family was happy and were a very tight-knit group especially with Megumi helping her parents in raising her younger siblings, whom she was said to adore like a mother would with her child. The life that the Yakotas knew, though, would flip upside down on November 15, 1977, when on that evening, Megumi would not make it home for dinner. As time went by, the worry turned into panic for Megumi's parents, and her mother, Saki, fled the house to search the area hoping that her daughter had simply lost track of time or was just at a friend's house. The small hope that Saki had was fading minute by minute though, and when three hours had passed since Megumi had last been seen by anybody, including the friend she was walking home with, police were then notified, and a massive search began instantly. 
Over a dozen officers searched the streets, buildings, and homes looking for the 13-year-old, yet nothing could be found. Many wondered how Megumi could have just vanished less than 800 feet from her home, with just being seen by her friends minutes earlier. How could a 13-year-old leave no trace behind, and how could there have been nobody to have seen anything suspicious? Was this intentional? Did Megumi want to disappear? Or was this the work of a group of people? Questions that were flooding the minds of both Saki and Shigeru as their search continued late into the night. Unfortunately, Megumi wasn't even in the Nagata Prefecture, the place that she called home. Instead, she was being held captive on a boat as it sped across the Sea of Japan. Locked inside of a pitch black storage room with every minute passing getting further and further from home to a destination she was unaware of. After 40 hours of being at sea, the boat finally came to a stop and Megumi found herself surrounded by countless guards. The helpless 13-year-old could only plead and cry as she held nothing to bargain with. She had no money, no information, and certainly stood little chance to defend herself against the soldiers standing in front of her. She quickly learned that she was in North Korea and that her being there in the first place was a giant mistake. A mistake that would go on to create a spiral that would see the countries of Japan and North Korea at odds with each other for decades after. Megumi at the time had no idea of just how shocking the full scope of what happened to her was. Megumi was taken and held, but not as a prisoner. Instead, the country of North Korea saw potential in her, especially since she was so young. Members of the North Korean military made a deal with Megumi. If she were to behave and aided in the mission of her abductors, then she would be allowed to go home eventually. A panicked and distraught Megumi was said to have urgently agreed to this deal. However, little to her knowledge, those behind her kidnapping had no intention of ever letting her go. Instead, what most would see as a scared and helpless young teenager, her abductors saw her as a tool that would aid in their ultimate end goal. Back across the Sea of Japan, weeks after Megumi's disappearance, a broken Saki and distraught Shigeru were trying everything they could to find their daughter. Shigeru would walk the area every night, including the beach where she was taken, searching for any sign or clue of her. In the following months, law enforcement would spend over 3,000 staff days searching for young Megumi. The Yakota's house was under constant supervision. The two siblings always had someone with them from that point on, and yet, no matter what they tried or did, nothing seemed to aid in getting their daughter back. Refusing to believe that she was dead, Megumi's parents accepted that she was abducted and put all of their focus into that, going on TV shows, radio, and making public appearances to continue letting people know that they are searching for Megumi and asking anyone to help. These pleads did not fall on deaf ears either. As more time passed, the country of Japan continued to talk about the girl from Nagoya. And unfortunately, Megumi wouldn't be the only one who would end up vanishing. Near the anniversary of Megumi's disappearance, a couple over 900 miles away from the Nagata Prefecture in the Kagoshima Prefecture decided to spend the evening together and watch the sunset. The couple was 24-year-old Rumiko Masumoto and her boyfriend, 23-year-old Siuchi Isakawa. 
As the pair sat on the beach, enjoying the cool breeze in the air and the crashing of the waves, neither of them knew that this would be the last night their families would ever see them. The next day, police would find their car with Rumiko's wallet and other belongings inside, with no sign of the young couple anywhere to be found. At the time, nobody thought to connect their disappearance with Megumi's. They were significantly older in terms of social norms, and for the first few days, police feared that the couple had actually drowned. But after a week and a search of the waters that produced no bodies, the idea of both of them running away together came to mind to police. They were in the age where young love could move mountains, and perhaps they sought a better, newer life away from the place that they called home. However, to both of the parents of Rumiko and Suichi, none of it made sense. With Rumiko's mother insisting her daughter wouldn't just up and leave when she had actively been making plans for the near future. Many pointed to her leaving her wallet as another troubling sign due to the obvious. Her money was in there, and they probably would not get far with very little money. The entire thought of the couple being abducted didn't come to light for some time, as these were technically two adults, and the likelihood that someone could have overpowered both of them seemed a little far-fetched to investigators at the time. Over the next few years, more people from around Japan would vanish. Again, at first, nobody would correlate one with the other, as they occurred all around the country with Megumi being in the Nagata prefecture, Rumiko and Suichi being in the Kagoshima prefecture, others now known as the Missing 17 would go on to include Yasushi Chimura and Fuki Hamamato, would disappear from Obama Fukai, Yutaka Kumi would vanish from the Isakawa prefecture, Yoiko Taguchi vanished from Tokyo, Yukiko Ukondo would last be seen in Kashiwazi, and Tadaki Hara would disappear from the Miyazaki prefecture. These vanishings would take place from the years of 1977 to 1980, and none of them were linked together for over two decades. Those previously mentioned, and the others included in the Missing 17, would unknowingly, to their families, all be tied together by a very dark secret that once announced would shock not only the country of Japan, but the entire world. During the years of these random people vanishing, rumors began to spread that they had been taken, and that it was far more than just a handful of strangers. The number of those taken from Japan went into the hundreds. People reported to police that they had been attacked and were attempting to be taken, but they were able to escape. Korean cigarette packs were found all across the shorelines of Japan. As tension and more families of the victims who refused to settle for anything other than the truth continued to build, the stress and demands the government of Japan was receiving was being felt on all corners. Nobody had any idea on who could be responsible for these vanishings. And it wouldn't be until 1987, a full 10 years after Megumi's disappearance, that the truth would start to come out. The families of the Missing 17 had no idea that it would take something equally as tragic and devastating to finally get some kind of answers about their missing loved ones. On November 29, 1987, Korean Air Flight 858 would depart from Baghdad, Iraq with two stops, the first in Abu Dhabi and the second in Bangkok, Thailand. Shortly after the place left Bangkok, at 2.05pm, 
the plane lost contact with radio control and went silent. There has been a second air disaster in two days. A Korean Airlines plane has disappeared over Burma and may have crashed into the sea or dense jungle. 115 people were on board the plane. Keith Miller reports from Seoul now on those who waited for the plane, which never arrived. The friends and relatives of the people aboard flight 858 heard from a TV news bulletin that the flight with 115 people aboard had vanished. Some appeared in a state of shock. A few prayed that this was not another airline tragedy. Officials placed emergency calls for assistance in finding the aircraft. It was already five hours overdue. One official suggested it had been hijacked, because by now, that sounded like good news. Among the Korean passengers were two foreigners, but no Americans. Korean airline officials would not speculate on reports that the plane had crashed. They insisted that relatives stay together in nearby hotels to wait for word on what exactly happened. Attempts to reach the aircraft were made numerous times, yet nothing was ever heard. After being late on their arrival time by two hours, a search began for flight 858, yet nothing could be found. As the families of those on the flight waited for any news on where the airplane was, panic grew into a full-on breakdown. Six days later, everyone's worst fear was realized when wreckage of the plane was found washed up in Thailand. All 115 on board Flight 858 died, with none of their remains ever found. The investigation into the disaster led police to two people of interest, a man named Kim Sung and a woman named King Yan Wee, were seen departing the plane before its demise. Once tracking the pair down, both Kim Sung and Kim Yeon attempted to take their own lives when they realized police were following them. Kim Sung died, but Kim Yeon managed to live. She was taken to Seoul, South Korea for treatment and while there was heavily interrogated by police. She at first denied any involvement, yet was unable to answer certain questions with a normal response time, almost appearing that she needed to think about certain answers. Suspicion grew even more on Kim when she attempted to attack a police officer while being questioned. Even after all of that, however, the main reason law enforcement linked her to the disaster was that she attempted to take her own life with cyanide when being arrested. A not-so-normal response for most people, and when they consider that cyanide poisoning was a very common way at which North Korean agents would use on themselves, dots started to connect. After more questioning, Kim finally admitted to police that she and her accomplice planted a bomb on the plane, causing its detonation eight hours once it was started. This news was closure to the families, but in the worst way possible. The world was shocked to see such an act, and they demanded justice. Kim was only 25 years old, and to many, the fact that she was so young and also a woman excluded her from the common demographic of terrorist. She was, however, nonetheless facing the death penalty for the crime she committed. Yet, Kim wasn't done with her story. Along with the confession of the attack, she also had something else to admit, that she had been brainwashed by North Korean agents and used as a tool by them. Now, I know many of you are probably wondering how this has anything to do with Megumi, and I will explain briefly. I just needed to give you that backstory before, so all of this made sense. With Kim claiming that she had been brainwashed by the state and turned into some kind of agent for them, many doubted her claims. But, when she started naming people who were a part of the Missing 17, people's attention started to perk up. As crazy as it all sounded, Kim was claiming that a woman by the name of Yaiko, whom had been kidnapped by North Korean agents years prior, had taught her Japanese and actually lived with her for two years while Kim was trained to become a North Korean agent. 
The Yaiko that taught Kim Japanese was the same Yaiko that had vanished from Tokyo in June of 1978. And more importantly, Kim claimed that there were others, and that they were alive. Following the trial of Kim Yeon, and after being found guilty, she was later pardoned by the South Korean president for being brainwashed by North Korea, claiming that she was merely a victim herself. The talks of others in the missing 17, and potentially them being alive after over a decade of being labeled as missing, grew, and attention was on Japan's leaders to act on this information. However, due to the hostile relationship between both Japan and North Korea, the accusations that they had been kidnapping Japanese citizens and using them as tools to strengthen their own secret agents seemed preposterous at best. The little talks that both governments had of the accusations led to quick and stern rejection and denial by North Korea. And as shocking as this may sound, it remained in this limbo state until 1997. In January of 1997, Megumi's parents, Shigeru and Saki, and their two children continue to hold out hope. Some kind of hope that their daughter, who would now have been 34 and had been missing for 19 years, was still alive. The family received a phone call from a man named Tatsukichi Hayamoto, claiming that he had information that Megumi was still alive. This news elated, but also scared the family, as they had little to trust the word of this strange man, and feared it could just be a sick prank that someone was pulling. But the information that he gave was seeming to line up that it was indeed her. He said that Megumi had since married and now had a child, and that she was living in North Korea, being unable to contact her family for fear now of her own family being at risk for treason. This caused an avalanche of attention to be refocused on the case. Against the warnings of Hayamoto, Shigeru and Saki went public once again and demanded that the Japanese government get involved and get their daughter back. Not only her, but all of the families still missing those that were taken from them. 1997 was a very different year than 1977. By then, the internet, while still not as widely used as it is today, was relevant. Information was getting out there faster, and more and more attention was being made on this developing story. But still, even after all of this, there was still no word from Megumi herself. After five long years, with mounting pressure, the heads of government for Japan could no longer avoid this growing matter, and finally called a meeting with the then leader of North Korea, after a now historic meeting between the two leaders of their respective countries, North Korea admitted finally, after 25 long years, that they had in fact kidnapped Japanese citizens. But out of the 17 that had been taken, only 5 remained alive as of 2002. Anger could be one word to use that described how Japan felt about this news. Anger that after two decades of pain and grief that North Korea knew of it the entire time and lied numerous times to cover their own tracks. Talks eventually came to Megumi, and Kim Jong-un himself said he remembered hearing her name, and that her abduction was actually a complete mistake. North Korean agents were taking Japanese citizens in their 20s and never intended to take a child. It was a mistake that the North Korean leader claimed to have handled by executing both agents responsible for her kidnapping. Unsurprisingly, this did little to comfort the family of Megumi. They wanted their daughter back, not caring for any reason of why she was taken, but just wanting their daughter back. 
After this revelation, the families of the missing 17 were all together in one room and anxiously waited to hear the condition of their missing loved ones. They were all aware that eight of those 17 were declared dead, adding even more tension in the room. When the family of Megumi were brought into a room to hear of their child's fate, finally getting an answer after 25 long years of not knowing, yet the answer they got was not the one they wanted. Megumi was reported to have died back in 1994 in April by taking her own life when she was in a hospital being treated for depression. The news, obviously tragic and shocking, was immediately questioned by Saki who brought up the phone call back in 1997 that claimed Megumi was alive and had a family. More troubling news came out days after initially learning Megumi had died in 1994, when the family was told that she actually died in March of 1993. The report of her death that was sent to the family also included numerous errors and things crossed out. The family refused to accept this as true and continued to demand the correct information. The family wasted little time in having those remains tested and fortunately still had Megumi's umbilical cord from when she was born. It's a Japanese tradition to keep it. When DNA tests were performed on the ashes, the results didn't match. Since 2004, the family of Megumi have continued not only fighting, but being voices of protest for other families who have lost children. The media attention that Megumi's story created has been talked about seemingly year after year in Japan. And while it may not be making the front page of news each time, her name is easily recognized amongst many in Japan. With regards to the DNA not matching, Further scrutiny was placed on North Korea for unwilling to acknowledge the glaring holes in their story. With having inaccurate death records, witnesses deflating their version of events, and even DNA evidence proving that they have been lying about the condition of Megumi. There are those that believe she is still in fact alive, but being held somewhere in North Korea as she is seen as a valuable asset that could be used in the future. Others think that she knows too much about the secretive country to ever be released, but regardless, it is still widely believed in Japan that Megumi Yakoda is still alive. Saki and Shigeru have fought for over 40 years for their daughter, never giving up and having their story told time after time in countries all over the world. Updates are still made to this case in fact, as recent as 2017. In October of 2011, a defector from North Korea gave an interview with Japanese magazine Japan Today, claiming that Megumi was still alive and was unable to leave North Korea due to her knowing sensitive information. And whether it was pressing media attention on the story, or just someone in North Korea realizing things needed to be made right, in March of 2014, Saki and Shigeru traveled to Mongolia to meet with someone they had never met, yet were thrilled to finally be meeting. They were able to finally meet Kim Yoon Gyeong, Megumi's daughter, who was then 26 and with Kim was her own daughter. Although Megumi may not have been there, I am happy that her parents were able to visit their granddaughter and great-granddaughter. I truly hope that moment was as special and heartwarming for them as it could be, 
because no parent should ever have to experience what they have gone through. Another update to this story came in 2017, when the then President of the United States, Donald Trump, gave a speech at the United Nations General Assembly, at which he mentioned Megumi's story when talking about relations with North Korea. And nerve agents in an international airport. We know it kidnapped a sweet 13-year-old Japanese girl from a beach in her own country to enslave her as a language tutor for North Korea's spies. If this is not twisted enough, now North Korea's Showing how impactful the girl from Nagoya had been, both back in 1977 and today. On June 5, 2020, Shigeru Yakoda passed away at the age of 87. He was with both Saki and their two children, Takuya and Tetsuya, and as well, Megumi, as he had her picture next to his bed as he closed his eyes for the final time. Saki still continues to be vocal for her daughter and has written a series of letters to Megumi, sometimes voicing frustration and other times just a mother speaking with her daughter. I would like to end this story with one of her letters. Our Christian friends have been holding prayer meetings since 2000 and the 200th meeting was held last November. It makes me painfully aware of how long you have not been with us, but this isn't the time to dwell on the past. I want to take your place if it means you could come back to Japan. Every family member of the victims feels the same. Abduction is the separation and confinement of a person's life away from family and home. Failing to solve this issue would be our national shame. What should Japan be doing at this very moment? I would like all Japanese people to raise their voices as if this personally matters to them. North Korea must stop using the lives of these victims as pawns in political and diplomatic transactions. I pray that North Korea's supreme leader would understand that resolving the abduction issue will directly lead to a happier world. I think it's a miracle that I still have peace despite my extraordinary life. I know that this is only possible because of the support and grace I have received from others. The uncertainty of the future leaves me feeling futile, but I will continue to fight with all that I have. Megumi, dear, I have become much weaker, but I will never give up. So please don't give up either. Take care of your health for the day of our reunion. I am waiting for your return along with your brother and sister and the memories of your father. I hope that all of you found this story interesting. I know that many of you are going to have theories in the comments, and I truly am curious as to what all of you have to say about not only Megumi, but the story in general. This was one of my deeper dives into a story, and I was blown away by how all of this really happened. I hope the families of those who were a part of The Missing 17 are coping well and able to find some happiness in life. And for the family of Megumi, I hope one day your search finally ends and you are reunited with her. I want to give a special thanks again to the sponsor of this video, Skillshare, and as well, my top tier patrons. Borgov the Straightener, KCD, Jace, A Dumb Thought, Lena, OOD Hamhorde, Ryan93, Espeve, Sir Tony, Skelly, Andis, Bethany, Blake, Boop, D. Wilson, Marilena Pendoja, Riley Brennan, Math Won't Miss You, and Cat God. 
I also want to thank all of you for watching, and I will see all of you in the next one. Remember to stay safe out there, friends. Good night.